For me, it's it's the uh, it's the sound certainly. Um, I'm not a I'm not a analog purist in the sense that I think that analog is inherently better than digital. There's a lot of positive things with digital about digital music making tools. A lot of things you can do there that you can't do in the analog world. But um, the sound is is certainly very appealing, and it's something that. Um, that's the way that I learned electronic music was on analog systems, and I still have a lot of uh, affinity for that. But even more so, it's uh, it's the interface, and particularly uh, particularly when these instruments are used as performance instruments. So, uh, <clears throat> and in fact, there's a there's a the the reason really that I got into this particular instrument when I when I started studying electronic music. It was with studio instruments that weren't designed for performance. They were stationary. They didn't move out of the studio or anything like that. Uh, later on, I got into performing using MIDI control and things like that, and then eventually working with strictly just computers, laptop computers, when they got to be powerful enough to actually run electronic music on. Uh, that was great because I'd been carrying around all this heavy equipment for so many years. You know, it was really a pleasure to, to work with much more minimal equipment. Um, but when we moved here uh, from the city, uh, I found that my neighbor is a guy named Jordan Rudis. And uh, Jordan Rudis is a, a virtuoso keyboard player who went to Juilliard when he was nine and sort of later on got seduced by electronic music instruments. And now he's a well-known uh, keyboardist in the prog music world and prog metal music world. He, worked, he plays with a band called Dream Theater. And, uh, 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 but he, he had this classical background, but when he first got a hold of a mini mode when he was 19 or something like that, he completely fell in love with the idea of using this, uh, of just another way to use the keyboard that, uh, that really expanded his tonal characteristics. And so he developed this method of playing and he started playing with other people. This was back in the 70s now, where he would play by, wouldn't have any presets. Well, the mini mode didn't have presets, but so it was just. Uh, he just played it open. He played with one hand on the keyboard and the other hand on the knobs. And he had this, he developed this kind of technique whereby he could be continually playing and continually varying the sound at the same time so that his sound was always different. He wouldn't like just sort of pick a solo sound and then well with it. He was continually changing his sound in a very organic way. We did some jamming together playing some electronic music in which he played his minimo. And at that time I was playing uh, soft synths on the uh, on the laptop, you know, and that kind of thing, and using a MIDI controller and mapping all the parameters to the knobs and stuff like that, um, and having to use the mouse and so forth to get around. And so when I was playing with him and he was just playing the mini Moog, I was really struck by this fact that he not only didn't have those extra layers of stuff in between, he didn't have to map keyboard controls to parameters in the, soft, in the synthesizer. He didn't have to use a mouse. He didn't have to do any of that stuff. He just had immediate hands-on control of the sound directly. And uh, in, in, in the performance environment, that's really a very powerful thing to be able to do, to be able to have that kind of spontaneity. And that's really what I, after having played with them like that, I really got the desire to do that myself. And that's when I ended up ultimately getting this instrument. And uh, this instrument is a is an analog synthesizer, largely analog at least. Uh, has patch chords, obviously. Um, it kind of goes beyond what the mini mode can do because it has polyphony. I can play multiple voices and so forth. And it also is a, a contemporary analog synthesizer in the sense that it does have patch memory. It can remember the positions of the knobs, basically, and recall those in a patch. And it can even, to some extent, reroute the cabling because there's a matrix switcher in here that lets you to to a limited extent kind of reroute how things are patched. So uh, analog synthesizers aren't a, a modular analog synthesizers that you connect with patch cores are, are not necessarily very practical for performance when you're having to like jam the jacks in there and that kind of thing to get the sound. Uh, but on the other hand, they, they do have this really organic quality, this really immediate quality that's very appealing. This instrument, I think, in a lot of ways, combines the best of that. It, it has that immediate quality, but it also has the ability to have what I think of as higher levels of control, where you can change multiple things at once and be also able to recall presets. So you can immediately switch, like the things that I do, for example, when I play, I can immediately switch to being in tune uh, 
to not being in tune if I'm playing something non-tonal and then back again. Whereas with an analog synthesizer where you got to do that knob by knob, you can't really, you can't really work that way. So uh, this instrument is, uh, with the patch memory and all that sort of thing, is, and, and also this, is, this keyboard is part of the control. That's an important part. But uh, the fact that it is an analog instrument and does have knobs for everything and so forth, but it also has this the patch memory and that sort of thing. Um, is really why I chose this particular instrument. And, and it was really kind of, it grew out of these jams that I did with my neighbor, Jordan, and, and uh, wanting to make electronic music again that had that same kind of level of spontaneity and, and immediacy. I should emphasize that I, uh, I studied and, and learned electronic music exclusively on Moog instruments. And in fact, I never actually saw, I was aware of Buchla, certainly, but I never actually saw one until I bought this. I had never actually seen one in the flesh until I got my own instrument. I had just never crossed paths with them. Um, so my, my background was, was exclusively using Moog instruments and then ARP instruments a little bit later on and that sort of thing, but none of these so-called West Coast instruments, you know. Um, but the, the thing that really attracted me to this over something more traditional like a dot-com system, a synthesizer.com or something like that, is the fact that it is it, the the uh, the design philosophy is to put a lot of density into a module. I mean, every one of these oscillators is a dual oscillator. The filters are triple filters. The envelope generators are four in a package. That kind of thing. There's a lot of density in the modules, which makes uh, makes it so that you have in a in a pretty small package, a pretty compact package, a lot of functionality. So that's that's one that's one advantage of the Buchla philosophy, so to speak. But the reason I really went with this was because of this, this whole patch memory thing, because I knew that I wanted to perform with it. And I thought that this would really be a, uh, um, a very powerful performance instrument, which it turned out to be, in fact. Certainly, I've, I've done pieces. I've, I've created electronic music pieces, tape music pieces especially, that were based on coming up with an interesting sound, you know, just sort of experimenting freely and trying some different sounds and saying, oh, this is kind of interesting, maybe I can do something with this. So in a lot of cases, um, a lot of cases I would write pieces of music that were based on sounds that I came across just accidentally, if you will, that um, then led on to these other pieces of music. So very often, um, I know a lot of people work that way where they just sort of start out spontaneously kind of patching and see where it goes. because. Even though, even though you know the principles of how things connect, you know, with an analog system, just a very tiny tweak of a knob can make an enormous difference in the sound. And a lot of times uh, it's very hard to get that kind of precision to where you can reproduce things very accurately, for example, or where you can get, uh, uh, where you can, you can, you can have a basic idea, in other words, of what you're doing, but a very small tweak can make a very big change in the sound and, and lead you in a completely different direction. So uh, in that sense, the, the, the modular can be, uh, uh, it can be very creative. You can do a lot of interesting things with it because you can get lead places you didn't expect. Uh, if you're trying to do very specific things, sometimes it can be hard to do that again because of that imprecision sometimes that you get with analog systems. So uh, in my case, I, I have a somewhat unusual approach in that basically this is the same patch that I've been using for the last three years or so. And I keep, I add to it, it gets denser and denser as time goes by, but it's essentially one patch. And, and that's for my performance work so that I have many, many variations on that patch that are stored in memory that have a lot of different parameters and a lot of different settings and they sound completely different. But the basic configuration is the same and has been for quite a while. So when I, when I work with this system, and I really I, I haven't exhausted the possibilities of this sound, of this configuration yet at all. So when I work with this, I'll start out with some kind of basic, basic concept and then work variations on that. And if I come up with something I like, I save it. You know, sometimes that actually makes a new piece. The thing I was messing around with before, actually, I think is going to be a new piece of music. That uh, something that just happened spontaneously while I was waiting for you to set up, essentially. Um, so in my case, I really just have this one concept and I work variations on it. Eventually I'll exhaust that and I'll try something else. But, um, there's, that whole, but there's a whole other approach too where you, uh, 
In fact, I have a performance coming up in, April, in, in August at an experimental music festival, specifically experimental music. And I'm going to try something different there, which is to start out with a completely bare system and build up a piece by building up the patch. So the, the, patch will be, will, the patch will be the piece, essentially, and the structure of the piece will be assembling the patch, basically. And uh, I'm going to have probably some idea where I want to go with that, but I want to try to make it spontaneous and see, what, see where it goes, to make it truly uh, uh, something that hasn't been heard before, you know. The Moe's didn't have keyboards originally either because they were meant to be experimental music uh, creation devices just like the Buchla. So they started out kind of in the same place, definitely. They had different approaches to the way that they structured the, the design philosophy of the instrument, but the, the basic approach was that they were both expecting this to be used by uh, academic composers in, in laboratories and universities with the white coats and all that stuff, you know and making experimental music. And so keyboards were disdained in that world. You just wanted to be able to make the sound. You didn't want to be tied to the black and whites, you know. Um, but then when, the, uh, when commercial music started to pick up the idea of being able to have all these new sounds available, they still obviously wanted to be able to do stuff tonally. So, so Mo made the decision to add keyboards, which I think was commercially, it was a good one, certainly. And uh, commercially, the idea of making the mini mug was a great idea too, because you then had a very compact, portable device that was more limited than a modular, but at least you know had a keyboard right there and had the sounds you wanted right there, and and you could plug it into an amp, you know, and you could kill the guitarist with it. So, uh, Buchla's philosophy—he actually has had keyboard, he has had synthesizers, a couple that have had black and white keyboards on them, but he didn't make very many of those. And so his philosophy was always to um, avoid that kind of tonal thinking for the most part. Um, and uh, it, it certainly, I think, affected his, his commercial prospects perhaps that way, although I don't know if that was necessarily his interest. Um, it, if sometimes, I think as kind of happened in Moog's case, he got too successful and couldn't meet all his orders, you know. And, uh, Buchla never had that problem, at least. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Popular music had to catch up to the point of being able to be open to more different kinds of sounds. And that's, and that, you know, that's been the way it's been going all along, of course. Uh, it used to be popular music was strictly what you could play with an orchestra or what you could play with a big band, you know. And those were the sounds that you used. And then when rock and roll came in, things started to get a little more open in terms of the sound palette. And, uh, and dance music opened that too, but particularly when then people started using electronic instruments for that, those were the sounds that those things made, you know, so you didn't have a choice necessarily. Uh, but I think it's interesting that even in, in uh, commercial music that's designed for, for dancing, you know, stuff that's very, very straightforward rhythmically can be very adventurous sonically. You know, you can have a lot of really wacky sounds in there as long as there's the beat. And um, there's a lot of room for other kinds of timbral exploration there. And I think that's great, actually. I think that's very cool. I like the idea that, that people are expanding the, the sonic um, repertoire of, of that kind of music, even commercial music, you know. When working in the studio, when you, and you would have a target sound of some sort that you were working for, the idea was that even if it was a sound that you were imagining that you hadn't heard before, um, you could analyze the sound, and, and I was taught to analyze the sound that way uh, and, and break it up into uh, the components that you then could assemble to make, to make that sound. So you were, you, we were taught to, to uh, break the sound down and then be able to build it back up again. And um, that's very much a technical approach. And, and all of this equipment came out of lab equipment, basically. I mean, the first electronic music studios were lab, had lab equipment lab tape recorders and lab oscillators and things like that that were designed for scientific use. So uh, that's certainly the tradition. Now, when you have manufacturers who may be very small, very small crews or very small businesses that are maybe making one or two modules, they want to try to differentiate themselves for one thing. Uh, they may have come up with a unique idea that doesn't necessarily lend itself towards uh, 
um, these kinds of descriptive processes, you know. And sometimes they just do it to be wacky, you know, to like uh, in, a, in a rock and roll kind of way. A guy named Keith Fullerton Whitman, who is one of the really most interesting new uh, modular synthesizer performers now. He doesn't use a keyboard, he does, but he doesn't use tracks or anything like that. Everything is, is created right there with the instrument. And he's got a million different little weird Euro rack modules, some of which are betas that don't see the light of day and stuff like that. And some of them are completely incomprehensible. Some aren't even in English, you know. So, uh, or they're in some made up language or something like that. And so I can see that in some cases people do that to encourage you to experiment so that you don't get led into a particular way of thinking about the device, whatever it is. Uh, and there's not, even on this thing, there are some, there are some things that are labeled just for the sake of whimsy, you know, or, or something like that. Like the, like the white noise generator, everybody else calls it a white noise generator. With Buchla, it's the source of uncertainty. So, uh, you know, and, and he has this kind of whimsical aspect to him in a lot of ways that you don't expect from somebody like that. Electronics generally don't get better with age, particularly the little components, the little components like capacitors and things like that. I mean, those things definitely have a, have a shelf life. Uh, it's not like the, the, the wood of a fine violin that's going to age better and better just indefinitely as long as it's maintained. With, with electronic instruments, eventually they start to fail. Components start to fail, they become inaccurate or they, they can't maintain a tune or, or whatever. So uh, I think that in most cases, I wouldn't say everybody who's doing that certainly, but, but many of the many people who buy that stuff uh, and the prices are getting very inflated for those things now too. Um, many people who buy them, I think, are, are buying them for the fetish sake rather than necessarily because they're great instruments. Uh, you know, but it depends on what shape they're into. And, and in a lot of cases, uh, there are old Buchla modules that would fit in this cabinet, but that he doesn't make. He hasn't made current versions of them. There's a whole series of all kinds of interesting, wacky things that he did that uh, would be fun to have that are just not available otherwise. So there's, uh, there's that. Sometimes, you know, the only way to do so, the only way to get a particular function is to buy an old, an old module. But generally speaking, like I said, I don't think electronics really improves with age. The usual architecture of a sound was the subtractive model where you take a, you take a waveform that's a rich waveform and you put it into a filter and remove harmonics from it and maybe layer that up with other things like that. But you start out with rich sounds and you reduce the complexity of them to make more organic types of sounds. Here, uh, and that really depends on having a lot of filters. Obviously the whole, the whole really important aspect of subtractive synthesis is the, is the filters. You can have a viable Buchla system that doesn't have filters in it. And uh, very often that's more of a secondary consideration with a lot of people who use these systems because the waveforms that you can get out of the oscillators themselves are so rich and varied. And uh, like in a, in a Moog, uh, in most, not even just Moog, but in most um, of the old style analog synthesizer oscillators, they had really just kind of four waveforms and maybe a variable pulse wave, but it was like, you know, your standard sine, triangle, sawtooth, square wave, maybe a variable pulse, but the waveforms were very fixed. And then you would have to process those after the fact to get to get interesting changes happening in the sound. With these, the oscillators are not at all fixed and you can start out with a sine wave and shape it into something else completely that is related to a sine wave but is not at all sounding like a sine wave, but that doesn't sound like the other ones, like a square or a sawtooth. And you can do that continuously and you can do that under voltage control and that kind of thing. So you have, you have the ability to have very rich uh, harmonic activity in just the, in basically in the oscillators themselves. So the, the filters are less important then. Uh, and this, the system is also really designed to have a lot of FM modulation going on. So a lot of the timbre generation is done through FM. Because again, as I mentioned, all the oscillators are dual oscillators. So every oscillator has its own FM modulation source built in, which is how they're very often used. So, uh, yeah, again, it's, it's additive in the sense, it's not traditionally additive where you're actually adding harmonics, but it's additive in the sense where you tend to start out with less complex sounds and make them more complex by, 
frequency modulating them or, or wave shaping them or something like that. So yeah, that is, it's, it's not strictly additive, but it is not strictly subtractive either by any means. I can have uh, basically five voices at once, and typically I use four under the control of the continuum, which is because the continuum with the control interface that it has um, is a four voice system. So uh, I designed this instrument, I designed this configuration, because it's a modular synthesizer course, so you can get whatever modules you want. I designed this particular one so that there would be four voices that were controlled by the continuum, and then a fifth one that could be controlled by the sequencer very generally, so that I could have this doing something automatically and then play on top of it, you know, and that sort of thing. That's really what I was thinking of. So these four oscillators that you can barely see under all this stuff, these four oscillators along the front here are not always identical, but if I'm playing something tonal where I want to have the same voices, they're often very, very close to each other in terms of their timbre. Other times, if I'm doing more abstract things, they can be completely different. That's really just how the patch is set up. This is an important part of the system because this provides some very expressive control that I don't have otherwise with, um, with standard keyboards. And, and this is called the, the Hocken Continuum Fingerboard, made by a guy named Lippold Hocken, who was, a, who was a, a doctor of physics, I believe, at Champaign, uh, Illinois, uh, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. And he is, uh, has designed this instrument, and this is a multidimensional keyboard controller. And it's a continuous smooth surface, or mostly smooth, that is uh, made out of neoprene, like you know, dive suit material, so it's kind of spongy. And underneath there are a bunch of sensors that can sense the position on the x-axis, on the y-axis, and on the z-axis. So it senses, senses two dimensions this way and then pressure. And those three values, it can actually sense that for up to 16 fingers, in fact, if you're using it with the internal sounds, because it has some internal sounds. But when you're using it as a controller, it can do up to... Uh, uh, up to, well, I, I can still do up to 16, actually, but typically it does up to 10. In this case, where I'm going through this thing over here called the CVC, which I'll explain in a sec, I'm limited to four because that's the nature of, the, of this interface. So this thing is called the continuum voltage converter, and instead of, instead of sending MIDI from this, this is, this is sending a very high-resolution protocol called I2C, which is going into this box, which is something that Lipold makes, that sends out 12 channels of control voltage that uh, are for the four fingers in each of the three dimensions. And now I have those patched here through this harness into all these various locations over here so that they can control pitch and timbre and amplitude and so forth. So yeah, in fact, there's a, a sound here that's probably appropriate. Let's, I'll just do a very basic sound here. So the um, I have it set so that the pressure controls the amplitude directly. I'm not using envelopes. These are like finger control envelopes in a sense. And the pitch is this way and timbre is this way. And this could be a filter closing or opening or it could be wave shaping or any combination of those things. So, oops. So when you press, let me take the delay out of here. When you press, it initiates the sound. It also has very precise and flexible pitch control, so you can do very, uh, very expressive vibrato. You can slide the pitches and so forth. And you can do that for multiple fingers. And I can also change the timbre this way. And I can do that independently for... Like so. And um, so rather than, rather than generating envelopes all the time, you have direct finger control of the amplitude. So you can play things very percussively if you want, or you can play things very slowly. <laughs> 
so I can I can very freely move from pitch to pitch even within a chord like that. Uh, and then if I'm doing non-tonal things, then I have a, a huge amount of control over the timbre, and so I can get uh, just a you know a thousand different timbres under fingertip control. <laughs> Really, just depending on what sound is happening at any particular time. So, so there's there's a lot of a huge amount of timbral variety in there and again I was you know I was just really kind of switching through these different settings where some things are in tune and uh, some things are non-tonal and, and some oscillators are controlling other oscillators and that sort of thing so you can have you can have a situation where everything is very carefully controlled and predictable or you can have it where it's chaotic and unpredictable in terms of the in terms of the timbres or really what's going to happen at any one time and I have played in quad a few times there are, there are a few places where I've been able to do it and the instrument itself is inherently designed to be played in quad. It's really a quad system. And it has, this is a four channel mixer over here. And you put up to eight different inputs in. And with the four main ones, it can automatically pan around the room. And in fact, do it independently for each of four voices. So it has these uh, swirl controls over here that are swirling the audio around in the, in the quad space. And as you see, they're independent for each of those four voices. Many people are listening to music in environments where the space doesn't matter, where you're listening on headphones or you're listening in, in earbuds or you're listening to the television or something like that. Um, it's, it's rare, or even in a concert situation, even in an acoustic concert, you know, the, the space, spatialization is basically where people are sitting. So uh, with electronic music, um, there, there is a there is a movement in electronic music that is very very much you know very much dedicated to the idea of moving things in space and and uh, very precisely controlling the distribution in in the space. But uh, I think for most people, it's uh, well most people probably don't have the kinds of sound systems that really are going to make a difference in terms of in terms of playing music that way. But I think that. Uh, a large part of it is simply that stereo is good enough for most people, and particularly in terms of the way that most people listen, which is uh, through through earbuds on, with compressed audio on, pocket devices. You know, I am really dedicated to performing, and the this is a this is a performance system. Everything that you're seeing here is really the bukla is part of that system, but I'm not. Um, there are people who think of the studio as their instrument because the, what they're producing is recordings. In my case, recordings are sort of incidental because I want to try to be able to make all the music that I create be performable. That was something I decided back in the 90s that I decided that uh, I didn't want to do, for my own music at least, my personal music, I didn't want to do music that was not able to be performed by a live musician. So. Uh, I kind of dedicated myself to that back then. And this is, this is a continuation of that. Essentially everything, all the recordings that I have of music for this instrument are uh, essentially live recordings. They're played in real time and, and they're designed to be performed. Because uh, one of the things that I find ap appealing about performance is the fact that there is spontaneity. And that uh, um, I was a jazz musician for a long time and, and jazz is about improvisation, you know. And I, that was one of the things I really loved about it was that every performance in jazz is different from every other performance, and or it's supposed to be at least. Uh, and uh, I try to make my performances spontaneous and have that degree of unpredictability that you can find in jazz. I play some of the same pieces from performance to performance, but but because they are performed, there's always a variation there. So in my case, this is, this is an instrument. It's really my, my performance instrument. And the fact that I'm in the studio now lets me make nice recordings here and so forth. But I think it is, uh, this is really designed to be something to play out with, to perform with.
A lot of the patches that I designed are intentionally unpredictable. They have sources of uncertainty built into them of various sorts. So that I, if some patches, when I play the sound, the sound is completely different every time I put my finger down because that's the way that the sound itself has been designed, you know? So occasionally that's, that's very intentional. That unpredictability is very intentional. And you can have a lot of degrees of that from just the, the kind of variation that happens from performance to performance if I'm playing something tonal to the fact that the sounds themselves may, may never show up again because they're kind of a unique combination of things that happened right at that moment. And uh, uh, that's very, very cool, actually. I really like that idea, that the fact that it can be very different from, from performance to performance. I don't use any, anything pre-recorded or anything like that, you know, so I try to make my performances as spontaneous as I can, you know. Uh, the fact that very often things happen that are unpredictable is good, I think. And sometimes I get led into interesting pathways that way.